So the uterine phase, again, these <clears throat> one, um, wait, sorry. Okay, so what we just talked about was the ovarian phase or the ovarian cycle. So the changes that happen with hormones, the changes that happen with the follicle through the ovary um, throughout that 20, 28 day cycle. What we'll talk about now is called the uterine cycle. So how do we compare these changes that are taking place in the ovary with changes that are also happening in the uterus? So the follicular and luteal phase correspond to different phases of the uterine cycle. The follicular phase corresponds to the menstrual phase, which is the shedding of the endometrium, and the proliferative phase, which is the, um, uh, the proliferation of the endometrium. And so we have these one to five and six to 14 corresponding with the follicular phase. Days 15 to 18 are the secretory phase, and these correspond to the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So don't confuse the ovarian events with the uterine events. So let's start by looking at the first phase of the uterine cycle, which is the menstrual phase. This is the shedding off of the lining of the uterus. So we have blood flow decreasing, right? Capillaries are dying. They're decreasing in their density. We have decreased, um, decreased, decreased glands that are secreting mucus. We have tissue dying and being sloughed off. And this is the first phase of the menstrual phase. This happens on day one of the menstrual period or the menstrual cycle. So that's day one. By about day five, that should be done, right? The, the bleeding and the shedding should be done by about day five. Day six to day 15, we have the proliferative phase taking over. And this is basically where we have decreased levels of estrogen and progesterone, and this causes, <coughs> I'm sorry, wait. I think I'm confusing myself. Okay, so I sort of skipped over the, hormone, the hormonal component to this phase. So the hormones that are influencing the menstrual phase are the decrease in estrogens and the decrease in progesterone. And as we mentioned, what, are the, what is the structure? What is the source of these hormones? What is the source of these hormones that are responsible? The corpus luteum, right? So as the corpus luteum regresses, we lose these hormones. And so the regression of the corpus luteum is sort of the stimulus for menstruation. The corpus luteum is saying, I don't need to be around. There's no viable pregnancy, so I'm going to regress. As it regresses, there's no estrogen, there's no progesterone, and so the endometrium starts to slough off. All right, so that's the hormonal component to the menstrual phase. The proliferative phase, this is where the uterus starts to develop itself all over again. This happens after day five of this cycle. So from day five to day 14, we have the endometrial line and thickening up. We have increased in arteries, increased in the capillary density of the um, blood vessels that are feeding the uterus. We have enlarged glands that are secreting mucus, etc., around the uterus. We have um, an increased thickness in the smooth muscle layer, the myometrium of the uterus. And all of these changes are to facilitate uh, a fetus, to facilitate pregnancy or fertilization. We also have cervical glands that are increasing their production of mucus. And this mucus helps to form what's called a mucus plug. So during gestation, there's a mucus plug that blocks the cervix. This is a two-fold uh, structure. It's preventing the uterine structures from leaving and preventing pathogens, bacteria, etc., from being introduced into the uterine cavity, into the birth canal. The hormonal control of the proliferative phase is going to be estrogen, as estrogen is being secreted, right, from, again, the estrogen is going to start being secreted from the new follicle that's coming in, and it's going to start stimulating the lining to come back, to grow once again. And finally, the secretory phase of the menstrual cycle, this is where the endometrium prepares for implantation. This is where things get really, um, how do I put it? Really tailored to pregnancy. So increase in the blood vessels, enlarged glands, you have glycogen-rich secretions coming from these glands, the thickening of that secretion, the forming of that mucus plug. So basically everything that's happening in the proliferative phase times 10, right? So just really increasing the uh, effort to um, 
produce and to maintain a viable pregnancy. So implantation into that uterus to maintain that pregnancy. So just to recap here, the menstrual phase is the shedding of the lining. This was influenced by the regression of the corpus luteum. The proliferative phase was the building back of that lining after the menstrual phase. This was influenced by new production of estrogen. And then the secretory phase was that final phase of really preparing the uterus for implantation, really preparing the uterus for feeding. All right, and this image just sort of highlights all of that. <clears throat> so again, we want to make sure we understand the uh, corresponding between the follicular phase and the menstrual and proliferative phase. So they're taking place during the same time. Right? And let's look at what's happening in the ovary. In the ovary, we have the development of the graphene follicle. And in the uterus, we have two things happening during the follicular phase. The first part of the follicular phase, which is the menstrual phase of the uterine cycle, that's where we have the shedding off of the lining of the endometrium. Whereas the ending of the follicular phase, which corresponds to the proliferative phase of the uterine cycle, that's where we have the rebuilding or the proliferation of the uterine uh, lining once again. And then towards the last, towards the ending or the, the second half of the cycle, both cycles, the luteal phase corresponds exactly with the secretory phase. And during this phase, what we see in the ovaries is the regression of the corpus luteum. And then in the <clears throat> uterus, we see extreme preparation of the uterus for the implantation of a fetus. And if that doesn't happen, we have the trigger, which is that drop in estrogen to stimulate menstruation. And the cycle starts over again. Um, it's my estrogen, estrogen. It's all the same. Okay. <laughs> it probably just is me. <laughs> Alrighty. So, so the hormonal changes during the menstrual cycle. Let's review those. So, estrogen is secreted from the follicle to start. We know that. Right, as the follicle begins to develop, it's going to secrete estrogen. When the follicle ruptures, what takes over the estrogen production? The corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum is what's left behind when the follicle ruptures and the oocyte is expelled into the um, uterine cavity, the uterine tube. Progesterone is going to be continued to uh, continue secreted from the corpus luteum, whereas LH and FSH we know come from the anterior pituitary. And the LH, LH and FSH are going to have an influence on the follicle. Now, the estrogens and progesterones are going to feed back, very similar to what we saw with the males. The presence of estrogen and progesterone feeds back to inhibit the anterior pituitary production of LH and FSH. Okay, that's a negative feedback loop there. Um, what we want to point out here, though, what I really want to uh, make a, a point of here is what is the stimulus for ovulation? So as you can see, if we look at the hormonal levels, the plasma hormonal levels of estrogen and progesterone, we'll see that there's an area where there's a large spike in the estrogen level. And from that large spike, there's a drop-off. So there's a steep drop-off in estrogen, and that steep drop-off is what triggers the LH surge, right, this large spike in LH, and that LH surge triggers ovulation. So I'll say that again. The hormonal stimuli for ovulation is the drop in estrogen, right, that, spike, that sharp drop off of estrogen, which then, stimul which then stimulates the LH surge, which is that rapid spike in LH. And from that rapid spike in LH, the follicle will rupture and the oocyte will um, ovulate to come out. All right, let's look at this flow chart here, which describes this hypothalamal pituitary axis, very similar to what we saw in the males. The hypothalamus secretes this tropic hormone. It influences the anterior pituitary to secrete those other two hormones we spoke about. These two hormones will affect the granulosa cells, those supporting cells of the follicle. And it's going to stimulate the granulosa, granulosa cells to secrete um, estrogen, as well as inhibin. We know inhibin is going to have a negative feedback effect on FSH only, right? Whereas estrogen is going to have a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary of both these hormones, 
and on the hypothalamus of the GnRH. So very similar to what we saw in males. Another thing we want to point out here is that the function of the granulosa cells is to promote uh, oogenesis and the development of that follicle. So under the influence of FSH, the granulosa cells will increase their production of this oocyte, helping this oocyte to become a graphene follicle and helping it to develop. Okay. All right. And this table compares the follicular phase to the luteal phase. And you can also go through it on your own time and make some notes there. We're not going to talk about pregnancy, so you can exclude any talk of uh, pregnancy and pregnancy regulation of hormones. All right. So what we saw earlier, this flow chart, was the early to mid follicular phase. Let's talk about the late follicular phase. So what is the late follicular phase? What is the cycle? Question? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I just need to confuse it because the function of granulosa under FSH is different. The granulosa cells are to support the production of the um, oocyte, support the production of the uh, follicle. Okay. All right. So um, this flowchart describes the events of the late follicular phase. And so during the late follicular phase, this is also what we call the proliferative phase. So what's happening here? The endometrial lining is starting to build itself back. So this is another one of those rare examples of a positive feedback loop. Let's see why. So the hypothalamus secretes GnRH. GnRH acts on the anterior pituitary to increase LH and FSH secretion. Both these hormones influence the granulosa cells of the developing follicle. And the follicle will now secrete estrogen. Now, estrogen at this point is going to feed back to the hypothalamus to increase the estrogen production. Okay? And what this creates, so this is what we call sort of a dose dependent or um, quantity dependent feedback. So if there's a certain amount of estrogen, it will have a negative feedback onto the hypothalamus. But beyond a certain point, if estrogen gets beyond a certain amount, it will have the opposite effect in terms of its feedback mechanism. It will actually promote or encourage GnRH secretion from the hypothalamus. Okay, so that's sort of different from what we saw um, with other feedback loops, right? So this is sort of a, um, I don't want to say dose dependent, but it is synonymous to dose dependent. Depending on how much, depending on the presence, the quantity of estrogen, that will determine whether it feedbacks negative onto the hypothalamus or positive. All right, and again, to compare some uh, functions and actions of progesterone in the luteal phase and pregnancy. And then finally, the luteal phase here, what we see is really uh, increasing the endometrial function, increasing the propensity for fertilization and for implantation. So we have anterior pituitary again, increasing secretion of FSH and LH. Those affect the corpus luteum at this point, right? Remember during the luteal phase, we have the sustenance of the corpus luteum, the yellow body. And that corpus luteum does three things. It produces hormone, estrogen and progesterone, as well as inhibit. And we know inhibit to feedback negatively on FSH secretion, whereas Estrogen and progesterone feedback onto both the hypothalamus and the pituitary to stop the secretion of FSH and LH. All right, so the difference here, well, the differences here is the structures that are secreting estrogen to start off with, the fecus, the uh, granulosa cells start the production of estrogen. And then we see the corpus luteum take over the production of estrogen as well as progesterone. Now, during this phase of the cycle, progesterone becomes very important. We'll talk about the unique functions of progesterone in preparing the body for pregnancy. Okay, any questions? All right, so puberty, we have estrogen, which encourages the secondary sex characteristic. These include widening of the hips, the redistribution of fat, right around the breast and hips and buttocks for women. We have changes in the oil production and oil glands. We have body hair changes and the, um, the development of pubic hair. We have growth of bone. So similar to the things we saw with, each, with uh, testosterone in males. Now during the reproductive years, estrogen is typically high and estrogen actually offers a protective function in women. So women who have estrogen or are producing estrogen during their reproductive years 
are protected against heart disease, are protected against osteoporosis, are protected against um, cancers of the uterus, some, type, some types of uterine cancers. And so beyond the reproductive years, as they move into menopause, these estrogen levels decrease. And as a result, postmenopausal women are at an increased risk for some of those diseases that they were otherwise protected against when they did have estrogen. So beyond reproductive years, the chances of a heart attack actually in, uh, equalize between men and women. Before reproduction, before, sorry, I'm twisting all my words. Mm -hmm. Before the menopause starts, women are less likely to get a heart attack. So there's that men being more, more likely to get heart attacks before reproductive year, right? After menopause, actually. We also have some other uh, side effects of menopause. Um, we have reversal of some of the secondary sex characteristics. We have atrophy of the vagina, of the uterus, of the ovaries. We have hot flashes. We have increased risk of those things that were, again, protected against, like osteoporosis and heart disease.